Hey, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good to be back with you for another You Be The Behavior Consultant. Oh, there I am. Yay. Always checking my audio, making sure we got you there. Uh, so yeah, I, I got a little bit of feedback that people are very interesting or interested. There we go. <laughs> interested in the topic that we're going to cover this morning. Uh, yeah, we're going to we're going to talk about um, what you know, what might be going, some things that I've just kind of observed in the animal training industry, I guess, well, I guess that's what we do every time we do one of these live streams, but just how there, there could be that, um, potential for people that have an interest in animal training to, um, be exploited, so to speak, because we are people that care a lot about animals and we want to improve animal welfare. And, um, and you know, that's, it's an industry, it's a business. And, and sometimes, um, people who have that kind of passion, you know, they might, they might be vulnerable. Um, and so we kind of, we kind of want to get into how that could be, um, used potentially to create groups that sort of have um, sort of a high demand or high control type of group, which sometimes, you know, is called like a cult, unfortunately. I hate that word. It's kind of, um, but we're, we're going to get into it a little bit more. Uh, so before we get into that topic a little bit more, let me just tell you what we're doing here. This is You Be the Behavior Consultant. It's a live stream I try to do every Monday. Last Monday I was out of town, so we didn't get to do it. So we're back again. And how it works, I present a topic for discussion. And uh, this this week uh, hopefully is going to be very discussion based. I would love for you all to participate and give your your thoughts and experiences and opinions, um, and uh, and then we'll kind of recap it all at the end. And before we get um, really far into this topic, um, I do want to ask you all to um, help me out a little bit here. Um, I want us to. Uh, protect ourselves on this one as we have the di this discussion. So what do I mean by that? So this is for your own protection, also for my protection, um, that we're not going to name any persons or businesses into today's discussions and call them a cult or a cult-like group. Um, I would also say that I would, um, I would su also suggest that we don't infer that any person or business in today's discussion is a cult or cult-like group. And I wouldn't um, recommend mentioning any names of a person that you think might be um, or speculate that you think might be a member of a cult or cult-like cult -like group. Um, yeah. And then Chris says, can you give me a real world example in the training sector? And I'm not gonna. <laughs> Because I think, um, you know, what we're setting ourselves up for is, um, you know, potentially somebody saying, you know, hey, that's not that's not what we're doing here. And um, and, you know, that could put, have all sorts of legal implications. And um, no, thanks. Not going down that road again. <laughs> so we're not going to name any names, um, but we'll talk. We can still talk about the subject without without um, putting anybody at risk, including you who are participating in this. So no names, please. No names of businesses, no names of individuals, and um, no names um, are, are necessary to talk about this topic. So, um, so I'm gonna just keep reminding you that as we go in through this discussion. Uh, so, uh, um, but we can, you know, what I can do is I can kind of help you guys see what I mean as, um, you know, as we get through this, but without without talking about names of, of businesses or speculation about businesses. So um, so let's kind of get into the topic. Um, OK, <laughs> just an example of what exploitation looks like. Well, I think. I, uh, OK, thanks, Chris. Thanks for your clarification. <laughs> Sorry. So Chris was asking wasn't asking for names, just an example of what exploitation looks like. So I think it'll come it'll come a little bit clearer as we get into this, this discussion here. Um, and so maybe these questions will sort of uh, will prompt that. So, you know, what are characteristics of cults? And I think maybe um, we don't even have to look at at, you know, the animal training community per se, but maybe some of the things or notions that you might have had when you think about um, sort of that definition outside of animal training um, that might kind of get you thinking a little bit. And and what you can do is kind of think about we'll, we'll kind of compare and com contrast that to things that you might have observed in the animal training community. Um, so, you know, so just, you know, you might think about that. We can start there and then we can start kind of comparing that to observations that we have in the animal training community. And on, honestly, a lot of this started for me based on some resources that I was um, 
looking at for other reasons, to be quite honest. And and then it kind of took me in a different direction. And these resources were actually looking at, at the business world and and seeing how how um, sort of these high demand, high control groups were being used to um, manipulate people in the business world. I know we tend to think about about um, cults more like in religious uh, connotations or or maybe even political or political um, movements. So so if you kind of you know you can kind of start there but then start thinking about how how it might impact a business and then you kind of start realizing well you know the animal training community is just another business right but i think we're a vulnerable business because we have people that are so passionate about about um what we're doing with animals but then if you were to compare these other businesses or these other groups whether it's political or religious they're very passionate too, right? They're very passionate in what they're doing and what they believe in. So I think we are a, an entity that is um, is vulnerable as well. And uh, what's interesting is some of these businesses that were used as examples in some of the reading material I was looking at, you'd be surprised <laughs> at what they were selling. They're selling stuff that's, you know, you know, uh, it might be aromatherapy or it might be a fitness regime or it might be skincare regimes, um, you know, that, that the, the kind of, uh, then they're using the same kind of uh, um, approach, this high control, high demand kind of approach to create these groups of people that are, that are um, behaving in the same ways that you might see with a relig religious sect or a political group. So, so, so maybe that'll get your juices rolling a little bit to thinking about what might be characteristics of cults. What are some of the things that you think um, happen in a cult-like, high control, high demand sort of group? And, you know, does, does that help any <laughs> for people in their thought processes? <laughs> of what, what are some of the things that stand out for you? And you can take, you know, an example that's, you know, maybe something you've seen, you know, that's kind of a, a common example, whether it's, you know, one of the classic news stories of, of a religious um, type example or something to that, of that nature. Any, any thoughts coming for people? <laughs> do, you, do you want me to start with the definition maybe? Does, will that get people started? <laughs> I can do that. Um, okay, Lindsay's saying, I was thinking of creating brand loyalty could help start an influence towards cult-like loyalty. Yeah, for yeah, I think that's a great example. Yeah, brand loyalty. Yeah, yep. That I would say that that um, that might be a way. I, I think that's kind of like a, a a nice marketing term way of thinking about it. Yeah, but it it does kind of fall. I think if we were to change the wording a little bit it can fall in into that so it's sort of um you know i i kind of will only follow this doctrine but not any others like i only train this way um right just tip a toe towards it exactly so like i i only train using these methodologies but i i will not use those of anybody else's for example like I don't, I don't use any other resources. I only use this resource, and I can't, I can't use resources from, from anybody else because this is the only methodology I follow. So that could be, that could be sort of along those lines for sure. I think that that can be, can be kind of, um, y yes, exactly, or open, or open, being open to hearing from others. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think, I think you're right. I think that is an example. And I, and I have like, I'll, I have these kind of outlines. So I think that falls under one of the bullet points. So what else might you think of that might be a parallel <laughs> when you think about when, you, when the word, when the word cult comes to mind to you? And again, you can just take the, you know, oh, sorry, came in late, really relevant topic. Okay. And for the, for our, our late comers, remember, we're not using any names of any people or companies that we we uh, might think might operate in a way um, yeah so religion so what you know what are some characteristics of cults is what we're on here um, 
bullying and groupthink. Yeah, so I have groupthink as one of my um, bullet points. Yeah, so, and what is groupthink? So that's that idea that, you know, you're not going to think, you're not going to step up against the group and say, well, I think it might, you know, I don't agree with what the group is saying because that's going to, um, you don't want to upset the harmony of the group. You don't. You don't want to. You don't want to say something different from the group. So it's going to be punished. Um, it's also reinforcing to to go with the crowd. You're not gonna. You're not gonna do something outside of the group. And and the group is also going to make you feel bad. You you also don't want to be removed from the group because then you use you lose all your social reinforcers, right? So there's negative punishment there too. Ah, shared enemy of others that don't align with the mythologies. Yes, that's another one of those, right? So if you guys have a scapegoat, somebody else, you know, if you're part of this group and somebody else is the bad guy, it validates you, your group as being right. And those guys are the evil, bad enemy. Exactly. Right. Leaving a cult gets the person ostracized. Right. So that's another reason why you, you know, it's important to stay with the group because you're going to lose all your social reinforcers. Um, so it gets really hard to leave the group. And of course, there's things going on that make it even harder to leave the group. So there's, um, they, they're, they're doing other things that make it harder for you to leave. So it's really re it becomes more reinforcing to stay. And um, because that's become your whole life for some of these people, that that the group has become everything. And so if you were to leave, you're going to lose so much, right? Threats and ramifications if they don't get their way, right? Yeah. So if you are, if you are um, not uh, playing along, if you're not if you're not following the doctrine, you get punished, right? So if you're not you're not doing as the group says, you might get in trouble. You might get punished for for not doing it. Um, threats if you don't think the, the way that that the group thinks. So they may have you know a doctrine. This is how we do stuff, and if you don't if you don't follow it that way then, oh, you know, you're the bad guy. And you might become one of those scapegoats. You might become one of the, the enemies that didn't align with the mythology, mythologies even, or methodologies, even though you're within the group and, and you don't want to be that person. Large events that gather like-minded people in the group. So that could be one of the, you know, the reinforcing reasons why it's, it's fun to stay in, in um, the group, right? Because it can't be, it can't be all bad or why would you stay, right? Why would somebody stay? <laughs> yeah, so, so all these great um, social reinforcers are there. Cut off from friends and colleagues if you go against the, wa the wave, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a big negative punisher um, um, because it becomes, it can become one's whole life um, when uh, it becomes all your social reinforcers and if you, if you step out of line, if you don't follow the doctrine, then you can lose all that. So it can become really negatively punishing. So that's a great way to control and keep a member um, in, inside, inside the group, right? So remember I was saying another word for this is a high control group. So we've got the high control going on there by using of positive reinforcement, like the large events and the negative punishment. You'll lose all your social reinforcers. And the punishing, you know, if you if you don't follow the method methodologies, All right? You guys are getting a lot of them here. Now, now, see how you, if you start thinking about it, <laughs> you, it's it's really fascinating to see all the um, again the nonlinear contingent contingency analysis. One that comes to my mind is that you're not allowed, or are um, mine is that you are not allowed or are grown upon if you're if you question the question the beliefs. Yep. So so uh, um, that's that group think again. You can't can't upset the apple cart. You, you, there's sort of this not allowed to have you know this individual thoughts, right? Your your own ideas, your own original ideas, or bring in maybe you know ideas from outside the doctrine that already exists exists. Frown upon. Sorry, I <laughs> gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a clarification there. Coming up with lots of good ones here, guys. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Some good ones here. And um, and we have some other questions here too. You know how how a reasonable per a reasonable person might get um, involved with, you know, a group like that, um, and uh, and how it might be different from you know, a group, a group of people with a shared interest, you know, or just a good business, because not all, all group, well, I guess you guys are really kind of saying what some of the 
differences are right now. So those are all, all good examples. Um, offers of advancement or title gives members positive reinforcement and reasons to stay. Yeah, to stay. Yeah. So, so certainly within such a group, if somebody's staying in line and following, you know, all those, those rules, then they could get advancement. They could move up, move up the, the ladder. And, um, and so there is reinforcement there, right? So, cause you know, why would somebody stay um, if there isn't some reinforcement, obviously we're, we're seeing the negative punishers and the, and the, um, and the positive punishment that also keeps, keeps people um, staying, but there is positive reinforcement too that keeps people involved. And, and, you know, um, ranks and hierarchical labels. Yeah. And also, you know, when you think about getting involved in the first place, you know, it's not the punishment that gets somebody involved in the first place, right? There has to be some reinforcement that gets somebody involved in the first place, right? You know, why, why would somebody, why would a reasonable person end up in this situation in the very first place? There have, has to be some positive reinforcement in the first place, right? And, um, and we'll talk about, about how that might happen um, in a bit here. And you, and you might think, you know, and, that, and maybe you guys have some ideas on that. I mean, I have some thoughts too, but, but I, when I think about, you know, animal training, I can easily see how animal trainers might get involved. Um, right, often people may recommend the group to another, so brought into the fold by another. Yep, I think that's a, that's a really common way in, um, in for, a lot, for a lot of things, you know, not just our world, but I think that's, that's probably the most, um, the most common way in our world is that, you know, somebody says, oh my God, this is great. And so we do the word of mouth recommendation. Yep, yep. Yeah, you guys are coming up with some good stuff. Well, I'm, I'm loving this. So let me, let me do the definition and then I might, um, and then I'll, uh, you guys can keep adding comment, comments here. Um, so the uh, belonging, yeah, that sense of belonging. Yeah, you know, having, having other people that share a common interest. Yeah, yeah. So the term cult comes from the Latin cultus, meaning worship. So one thing that we... Um, and maybe this is the belonging that, you know, um, kind of hits on this a little bit because we didn't really talk about the, you know, what is the central thing that brings everybody together. And the cult is a group or movement exhibiting a great or excessive devotion or dedication to some person, some idea or thing. So that was the thing, you know, we've, we kind of missed the central thing that they're all coming together over something. And in employing, um, and it's interesting now this word unethically, because after just having been to this ethics conference, there was some discussion about, you know, what is ethics and, you know, is it a, con you know, is it a construct and everything? So that's a whole nother interesting conversation. Um, but employing unethically manipulative techniques of persuasion and control. Um, and of course, we've talked about how, you know, all these um, contingencies are controlling people. And here's some, you know, kind of a summary of it. Isolation from former friends and family, debilitation, use of special methods to heighten suggestibility and subservience, powerful group pressures, information management, <coughs> suspension of individuality or critical judgment, promotion of total dependency on the group and fear of leaving it, etc. Des designed to advance the goals of the group's leaders to the actual or possible detriment of members, their families, and community. And, um, and like um, I said, the, another term is high demand group or high control group, which I, I kind of like those, um, those words there. So, um, so I thought um, I've got some more slides here about characteristics. I'm trying to think how many of them we've already hit, but um, I think I, I might go ahead and bring, bring one of them up. Um, and it kind of goes into these in a little bit more detail. And again, please please continue with your comments because I think these are these are really good. And if you just joined us, I'm just going to remind everybody um, we are we are avoiding any names of persons or businesses um, that we might infer or or even think of as potentially being cult like, and or any persons that might be potentially in a group that we might think might be cult or cult-like just to protect ourselves. 
Um, so let's look at these characteristics. So this person, this image here, was just something that I have from my software that does graphic design. I have no idea if he trains horses. He, he, the, the graphic just said, model with a horse. <laughs> So I don't know if he even trains horses. Um, so uh, so uh, here are some characteristics that I found in my research on, uh, on what they say might be cult-like or high demand or high control groups. So there's usually unquestioning trust in an often charismatic leader. Ah, here we go. Uh, there is there are usually one or a few leaders, aka gurus. Yeah, you hit it. You hit it on the head there. Um, and I thought this was an interesting description. The leaders are often seen as special individuals with unique skills, knowledge, or talents, and um, and increased submission to the leadership is reinforced with additional responsibilities. And I think some of you talked about this with the ranks and, and um, you know, people getting advancement. Uh, and, um, and, they had, and so those people who are like really supportive of the leadership and the, and the gurus, as you're saying, they kind of get additional responsibilities or roles and praise. And so that increases their importance um, uh, in the, in the group. And so others see that, right? So, you know, the more you are, you know, in support of the, that, that leader, you know, the better. Um, and I think, I think this whole thing about that leader having special and unique skills or knowledge and talents is also kind of an interesting thing. Cause I've, I've observed that as well. I don't know if you guys have seen that it's sort of that person has got something, something magical that the rest doesn't. Um, and uh, and I'm sure you guys, have, you know, and you can see that in the animal training world. You know, there are some that are that kind of promote that that image. Um, exclusivity. I think this is another interesting one that not everyone will qualify to be a member of the group. Um, not everyone will be good enough or skilled enough, you know, not the right fit. And this can reinforce being um, selected to be a member. So it sort of makes if you got in to the group, you're special. You know, you, you, you made the cut, you made the grade. So that, that's part of that positive reinforcement that you're one of the, the special ones that got in. Uh, and then this one you guys mentioned already, the persecution that when somebody inside or outside of the group says, oh, you know, what you're doing's not right. Um, it, it's kind of interpreted as, oh, well, they're against us. That's the us against them thing. And that of course validates the group as being, well, we're right, we were right, you know, we're on the right path and they're not. And anyone who goes against them is of course a scapegoat. And, and um, you know, so they're, they're the bad guy. And of course, if one of their own is doing that, then they are now ostracized and they're the bad guy. Uh, and everyone, you know, turns against them. Um, oh, if you guys watched Westworld last night, you know, it's like the, it's like the machine being turned on and everybody goes, oh, it's you. <laughs> um, all right, control. Um, so the behavior and, and especially the verbal behavior, and I'm going to give you, um, uh, re I'm going to refer you to a book that you can read about this, um, of members is controlled via repeated indoctrination. So, um, so, you know, this is a, a lot of verbal behavior that that's telling you, you know, like, you know, catchphrases and stuff like that. Um, and uh, and there's reinforcement and, of course, potential loss of compu uh, community, um, loss of your position, loss of favor with the, the higher ups. Of course, that's the negative punishment if they do not follow the doctrines. Uh, and then isolation. Um, and so I think you guys mentioned this already, that there's minimizing contact with resources and information outside of those controlled by leadership. So this antecedent architecture, and again, all this is going to sound familiar to you because you're all behavior people. Uh, it further uh, f facilitates the control over the thinking and the practices of the membership by the leadership. So it limits the opportunity for learning and reinforcement to be contacted from other resources. So it's kind of like, you're only gonna do our stuff, right? So you guys got a lot of those things. I thought that was really awesome. Okay, so let's let's look at some more characteristics. So I talked about the positive reinforcement. 
And you guys may have heard the term love bombing before. And the term love bombing is kind of like when you're getting so much positive reinforcement just dumped on you. You're just flooded with, with positive reinforcement. And so this is when you're getting a lot of attention um, uh, showered on and, and a lot of positive reinforcement showered on a person. And this in in this kind of culture, it tends to be especially when somebody's first being brought into the group. And it could also happen when a person's having doubts. So they're being put on this intermittent schedule. So they're, you know, we know that there's this, this punishment happening as well, but there's also a lot of reinforcement in the recruitment process, but then there's this intermittent schedule of positive reinforcement that's keeping people staying, right? So it's like, oh, I think you're drifting away, time to, put some positive reinforcement on there and keep you in. So that's helping keeping people in, in the group. Um, another one, special knowledge. So another feature is that the, the, the leader may kind of say that I've got some special knowledge because of my privileged connections that, that nobody else has. And the leader, you know, then, then may let everybody know that, you know, ah, you know, I'm delivering you this very privileged information that only I have access to. And so it kind of potentiates this information as a very valuable reinforcer, right? That's so good. I, I, I will share this one little story without, you know, indicating where it came from. It was many, many years ago. But this one um, person claimed they got this information from this secret book that, um, that, somebody gave them and then the book disappeared and so they were the only one that had access to this book and um and nobody else had it only they had this information <laughs> and it was it was a you know we're pretty confident it was a story and i think it's based off of a book called the secret i never read the secret so i don't know um but uh uh, yeah, so uh, so it, it was just a marketing strategy, but but people bought you know people bought into the idea, but you know it was it, it, it's strategies like that, um, but it but it doesn't have to be as far fetched as that. It could be that you know just you know I have a special connection with this this special person, and they are the ones giving me all this information. Um, again, we talked about indoctrination. The teaching of the groups uh, of the group is repeatedly drilled into the members. So this is where I feel like sometimes the catchphrase thing and the branded lingo, this is I think where Lindsay was talking about branding. Um, it's not that branding is a bad thing. And, and, uh, um, and, you know, like we're saying, being a group isn't in a group isn't necessarily a bad thing. Um, but I think this is where like, if you are told you have to use this language and you know you're heavily reinforced for using this lingo and punished for straying from the group language i think that's when you know it might be a red flag um and and also if the inform if that if that language maybe isn't accurate you know i think we we did a live stream on that um on catchphrases and you know ones that we liked and ones that we thought oh you know they're not really helpful they're you know they're inaccurate and and we talked about like old ones from the from days gone by that maybe didn't stand the test of time so so i think it's one of those things where you'd have to evaluate it for for the value of the of the actual um you know branding and and you know catchphrases and all that um the group that is taught it is special uh so again this makes being a member very reinforcing and of course makes it negatively punishing to leave. This special status is maintained through association with the group and or in submission to the group, you know, its authority and its quote special knowledge, right? And then you guys already mentioned the group think. Um, and of course group think occurs when the group needs group's need for consensus supersedes the judgment of an individual group member. And of course, then you're gonna try to um, uh, you know, not upset not rock the boat, so to speak. And then here's the biggie. So exploitation. So group members are used to spread the doctrine and recruit new followers. And uh, we talked about that a little bit. And so that that tends to create financial gain for the organization or the leadership. But maybe the member is not making any money or maybe their income is limited. Um, and so their reinforcer for tar for participation, maybe that, you know, they're just doing something good for the world or good for animals. Um, it made me think a lot about like, you know, those people that volunteer their time at um, 
at certain places. You know, we, we have a lot of volunteer opportunities in, um, in the animal world. And, and sometimes we're doing it just for ourselves, you know, just for our own experience. But, um, but I could see where that could be taken advantage of very easily, um, especially if it's sort of like a repeated and, you know, over and over and over again. So, so there could be, you know, there, it's, it's kind of one of those things where you'd have to look at all the, again, you know, there's more to it than just, just that, but um, a lot of things there. So, so it sounds like, you know, you guys mentioned a lot of these, um, but these, all of these that are here, these characteristics, you know, they, these are not exclusive, obviously, to any industry. Um, they could, they can occur in, you know, all sorts of areas, right? I don't know if that, if that, you know, something that you were, as you were listening to those, if you kind of could see parallels, whether it's politics, um, retail, um, religious sex, sects, <laughs> S-E-C-T, or, um, or, you know, even, even within our world, you know, we're all, um, I think we're all kind of susceptible to that. So, um, so one of the questions we didn't really talk about yet was like, how, um, how does a reasonable, reasonable person get involved? And, you know, I, and Lindsay mentioned that, that we sometimes, you know, will recommend something to a friend. And, um, and there might be some other ways as well. Um, you guys are welcome to, to comment if you have some suggestions or, you know, ideas. And, um, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about recruits. Lots of, lots of words here, but, but again, feel free to, free to comment. Um, I think, I think, you know, when I, when I started thinking about the animal training world and then also just in general, I think in our world, you know, people, people join because of an interest, um, in what the group is offering or doing, but it, it turns into something, it can turn into something else. Um, and, and again, you know, it's not that all groups do this kind of stuff. Um, and, and it can, it can turn into devotion to the leader or the teachings of the leader. Um, and it's not that our member, it's not that members of the group are gullible. I think everybody is vulnerable to being recruited, right? I mean, I think this goes back to, you know, our book on, on freedom, beyond freedom and dignity. You know, we are all susceptible to the influence of the environment, um, cause I'd say a lot of the people that I know in animal training are really incredibly smart people, you know, they're really smart people. It's not that, you know, people are, are not great, wonderful, critical thinkers. I think it just happens that you get, you know, the environment has its impact on us. So people aren't intending to join a high demand or a high control group. They maybe sign up for a course, they get help for a problem, they listen to a webinar, they join a volunteer program. Um, and then, you know, we think of some of these things, that, you know, we have the impact of television programs. Um, Instagram ads are all over the place, you know, so, you know, face, Facebook ads. And then, you know, we talked about recruited by a friend. The more I learn that I am protected from re recruitment, at least I hope I am. I think, well, I think being knowledgeable really helps. I think the more you, you kind of see the, the more information you have, the more it helps, I think, you know, to kind of say, oh, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, you, you kind of go, oh, that's a red flag. That's a red flag. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the questions to ask to make yourself feel like, okay, I'm, I'm not sucked in. <laughs> um, uh, so, so members tend to, are led to believe that the work of the group is the most important things in their lives. Um, they end up kind of eating, breathing, and sleeping the ideas of the group. They use their ideas in their work lives, in their personal lives, in their social lives. Um, you know, kind of like not having a life outside of that, you know, that becomes their whole life. Uh, they're not ex aware of the extent of the changes in their behavior. They are 100% certain they are free, independent, and in making their own decisions. They will even get angry and argumentative if they are told they are not actually making their own decisions. 
The members are controlled using all the learning processes, kind of what we talked about before. Um, however, they're not aware of the amount of punishment that, that is used against them until after they have left the group. Um, and they're also taught how to deal with an outsider's objections. They are often given stock answers to the most common criticisms of the group. So if anyone were to challenge the doctrine or, you know, the, anything about the specific group that they're a member of, they would have answers for those kinds of things. So, um, so here are um, some questions that I think are good ones to ask, and this maybe ties into what you were saying, Chris, about you know how how would you how would you evaluate something? And the reason I have the yoga one here is because um, there was or the pictures because there's a, a documentary about one of the you know yoga groups that the more they explored it, the more they found you know some of these challenges. So I think I think things to ask are like, do the leaders have one set of rules for themselves and another set for the members? You know, like. Are they allowed to do things that the members can't? <laughs> and do they tend to justify the rules, you know, that they have that, you know, are different for them for the, than for the members? Um, and while the leaders say everyone is equal, does the leader set up competition between the members so that, um, you know, so and this, this antecedent arrangement can set the occasion for members to do desired behaviors to earn reinforcement and get attention from the leader. And it, it also kind of sets an example for the others to see, sort of like, this is what you have to do to get reinforcement. And, um, and it can also set up others to fail. And, and so it kind of keeps that cycle of reinforcement and punishment happening. Um, to, and so you see this kind of competition amongst people within the group. Um, and so it kind of keeps this internal strife going, uh, but intentionally. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's kind of like this little game. Um, and we talked about this already is the doctrine set by one source or limited sources with the fine. And does that, does the leadership kind of have the final say on everything? Like they kind of answer to no one. Um, so like, could members come up and say, Hey, I found this really cool new resource. Let's, let's, can we explore this? And if it's kind of like, you know, no, no, <laughs> then, you know, that could be something to explore um, a little bit more. Um, and again, is access to outside resources for learning new material relate, um, related to, um, is it limited? You know, is there really just sort of like, well, we're not looking at anything else except for what's in our, our limited pool already. This was, a, I, I think, a really interesting one that I found. And I, and, um, and I, I feel like I keep finding this more and more. Um, Let's see, uh, it can also maintain the leader's position and prevent the members from getting together to question the leader. Oh, if you have that competition going between each other. Yeah, I think you're. I think that's a really good point, Annetta, because what starts to happen is distrust between people. You don't know who to trust, right? The, the individuals aren't sure, are you aligned with the leader or, or not? And so people are afraid to you know, communicate amongst each other. Um, because they're not sure if you're going to turn turn them in, so to speak. Like, will this person, if I go against the leader, will they turn me into the leader? And then, yeah, I, I know what you're talking about there. Yeah, so there can be this like little, you know, everybody's wondering, you know, like when, because like when, when, when people, when dissent starts, it, it's, it's, you're not sure if you're safe or not. And so it's like they're tr people are trying to build alliances, but they're not sure who is still with the leader and who's not. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. In reality, you are alone with the leader's attention. Yes. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's very interesting, uh, complex. And because, yeah, because you could end up being the one that's the scapegoat that gets ostracized or perhaps... You know, there is a group of people that are trying to, you know, address the problems. And because I think because I think there's always this there was always these good intentions at one point and then something went wrong. Right. You know, and you kind of see that repeated pattern over and over again when you look at these stories about about these situations. Um, OK, um, so, yeah, I was saying about the Did you discover the ideas, the doctrine, the teachings, et cetera, were not original to the leadership and were not credited to the original source? Um, so that was discussed in some of the resources that I'll, I'll provide for you all, um, you know, in animal training fundamentals. Um, 
Yeah, and so a lot of these documentaries and things that I've watched and read, that is a repeated pattern uh, that that the teachings, although you know described as original to the leadership, they end up being actually not, <laughs> and that they are not credited to the original source. Um, and uh, so I thought that was an interesting pattern. And then, um, and of course, new ideas are generally not welcomed. And, or, or if a new idea does get incorporated, it's not credited to the source where it came from. So I thought that was another interesting uh, pattern that I saw. Um, again, we've talked about this already. Are the members required to use a certain lingo? And is it frowned upon to stray from this lingo? Our members' personal lives very intertwined with the group. Is, you know, is there no room for activities outside of the group? Do people just not have, you know, a personal life that's separated from the group? And are the members always on call? You know, do they have to answer that phone call that's related to group activities? Can they, can they ignore that phone call? How about this? Is leaving the group difficult? Are members afraid to leave? Are members financially unable to leave? You know, are you, is, are you just, you can't seem to get ahead of the, the, the financial situation to, to get out. And again, we've talked about the cycle of punishment and reinforcement. Um, we've talked about the scapegoating um, observed for those who speak out against the group. I mean, or its doctrine or those who do leave. I mean, to me, that's, that's really a big red flag because, you know, as we know in animal training, there's, a, there's so many different, we're, we're constantly evolving and changing. It would seem being able to talk about different approaches is a good thing, right? We're moving forward. And, and you know, and then the bottom line is, do the, the costs outweigh the benefits? You know, if, you're, if somebody was in that situation and making the decision, you know, is this the place to be? The questions asked to ask is, is it, is it more harmful to be here than it is beneficial? And, um, and so those are some questions that someone may want to want to explore. So those are, those are some things that, um, that stood out to me that would make me think that a group that I might be involved in might not just might be something other than just a group doing good things that I want to be a part of, you know, I mean, cause, cause there are groups that are doing good things that you want to be a part of. I'm sure. I mean, I, I like to think that I'm a part of some groups that are doing some good things and I want to stay a part of those groups. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so again, at any time you guys have comments, feel free to jump in there. I know this is some heavy stuff and I have a lot of words on slides here, <laughs> but if it, if it, if things are starting to feel like, oh, I see that, I, I get it, um, feel free to, free to jump in. Um, okay, so what about, uh, let's see, what were some of our, our other questions there? Helping, helping someone move on is kind of what I have here next. And I know this is, and, and I'm not like an expert on, you know, on all this, but some thoughts that came to my mind was, again, you know, you all know uh, that I've, I've been pumping this book, but it's a really good book. And, and I think one of the things that came to my mind, and I listened to um, some TED Talks from people that were, you know, that left um, actual cults, you know, that were more of the religious nature. And some of the things that kept coming up in their in their stories was about about you know I they just needed the tiniest tiniest opportunity for reinforcement. So meaning that if if people were available to them, like if you know someone who was outside their you know their cult environment was just nice to them or just or just said, you know, I understand or just said, you know, or just made it easy for them. So basically made it easy for them to take that first step or didn't judge them or didn't or didn't punish them or just said, you know, why haven't you left, you know, instead of, you know, saying, why haven't you left yet or yet yet or or you know, what's wrong with you instead of doing things like that and just instead just said, I'm here for you whenever you're ready, but made it easy for them to make that first step 
and then reinforced that step, you know, and supported them. So it really made me think about the constructional questionnaire and about, you know, looking for what is it that you can possibly do now? Um, let's put a procedure in place for you to make that tiny little baby step and reinforce that that little tiny approximation and basically avoid any situations in which there's going to be punishment um, so that they can be successful. And, you know, the constructional questionnaire is in there, which, you know, helps um, illustrate all the different contingencies that we've been talking about that are keeping them in place. And, and you know, and that, like we were saying earlier, might not be very obvious to the person in that situation. So, so I think there's a, some really good resources in there to help, help somebody that might be in that situation um, to, uh, to, you know, to move on. But, I, but I'm also going to show you, um, well, actually, I can do it right now. So this is um, a book from uh, Claire Ashman, but she also has some TED Talks that you might want to listen to where she talks about, you know, what helped make it possible for her to leave. And I think she does a really nice job of breaking it down into just, you know, some very easy to understand, uh, you know, steps for her and how she got out and what it was like and, um, and her situation. And, um, and I thought that was, um, those are really nice to listen to if you want, if you want to, you know, kind of get a perspective from somebody who was really in a, you know, a challenging situation. And, um, and the book that I've um, just finished, actually, uh, this uh, language of fanaticism, cultish, I think a lot of you would really appreciate it, because it's not really so much about religious cults or political, well, a little bit about political, but it's mostly about businesses and the business world and how, um, how business world is impacted by by um, mostly talking about verbal behavior, but she does talk about a lot of examples of businesses that kind of use this approach and some, and some of them which went on to do practices that were illegal um, and, um, and not to say that all, the, you know, all businesses that operate um, using these strategies that we talked about do things that are illegal, but some of them do. And one of them that is there's a video about is this one, um, this one video here, Lula Rich, you can watch that on Amazon Prime. And so that, you know, that business is referred to in the book Cultish. Um, and the video talks about what happened with that company um, that was producing clothing, you know, and, and, um, and they ended up doing some practices that they got sued over. Uh, um, but so that, that's something interesting that you might want to listen to. And again, that's why I was saying that, you know, if, if businesses that, you know, sell leggings <laughs> can, you know, create a billion dollar empire, uh, you know, and, and their, their strategy was to target, you know, women who wanted to be able to stay at home with their kids and, and, um, you know, make money from home. So, you know, and, and so, you know, I don't know, I don't know how animal trainers, you know, would be any less vulnerable. So, um, so those were sort of, sort of why I wanted to, to, uh, get on this. So, so, um, before I get into recap stuff, did you guys have any, I mean, I did a lot of talking here, <laughs> but I want to see if you guys had any additional thoughts, um, if you can see the the possibilities, how, how that might impact our world as well and see some of the parallels without naming names of any businesses. I did. I only named one, <laughs> but that was one that was named in those books. <laughs> and again, like I said, it doesn't mean anybody's doing anything, you know, illegal or anything like that. It's just, you know, potential, potential t for, for our community as well. I think not for illegal activity, but for, for, um, for, uh, I don't know, for people who want to do good. <laughs> no comments, no thoughts. Mm. <laughs> heavy stuff, isn't it? <sighs> heavy, heavy stuff. It's thought provoking, you know, like I said, those, um, those resources will get you thinking about, about some things. Um, all right. So what I might do then is I might, um, might go to our recap here. Uh, 
so I think those who want to learn about and participate in animal training have the potential to potentially be exploited and controlled. Um, yeah, Annette is just saying I think it's important to be aware of. Yeah, I, I think it's just an awareness thing. I think that history has d demonstrated that many industries from fitness, retail, religion, politics have created environments suitable for these cult-like groups to develop. And what we're seeing is that they they evolve uh, involve the use of contingencies to control behavior um, of of groups of people for certain outcomes, and often this results in power and money for those um, in leadership positions. Uh, and there are a variety of factors that contribute to such a group operating um, in a manner that results in conditions that are not optimal for its members. And when I say optimal, I mean maximizing benefits and minimizing harms. And some of or all of these conditions may be in, in, uh, in place for the group in question. So I think if we ask some of those investigative questions, we may reveal more information to help people do a cost-benefit analysis to, to first decide if participation is worth it. And resources such as the Constructional Questionnaire in the Nonlinear Contingency Analysis book would be a good place to start to build a new repertoire of behaviors and, um, and where to go next and how to get there. I, I think it can be really hard for a person to leave such an environment depending on how much of their lives was impacted by their participation in the group. But just because it's a group with a common interest, it doesn't mean it's exploiting members. Many groups do provide a supportive place for people to learn and share their common interests. So we can, we can keep that in mind as well too. So uh, some of your comments. Uh, uh, yes, this is an important topic and needs more discussion and awareness. Victims of group thinkers bullying can potentially experience serious emotional distress and even PTSD. Thank you for this. Yeah, I, 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 I get you on that. You know, I think that is a... Well, you know, and that's what we were saying about the contingencies, you know, if you're not, if you're not part, you know, that's, that's what we we're saying about the positive punishment and the, you know, being ostracized. If you're not, if you're not doing the group think, you know, if you're not playing by their rules, you know, for sure, um, there's some really, you know, really bad outcomes. Uh, I can prevent. I can prevent us for the real knowledge. We need to provide better welfare for our animals if we look for more to the person than the science um, from the real from the real knowledge. I, I I can I can prevent us from the real knowledge. We need to provide better welfare for our animals. Um, I agree, Annette. But who do we identify um, as their resource? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, and this is yeah, this is hard, isn't it? Yeah. I think you know, and I guess that's where. Um, you know, I kind of go back to these, uh, questions, you know, like asking these questions, these investigative questions. Um, oh yeah. And, and, uh, because it's an evolving industry, it can make you feel vulnerable and this is where it can be dangerous. Yeah. And Annette is saying we should always be open to new knowledge and not just follow the usual resources that anyone follows. Yeah. I think, I think that's, that's, um. I agree with you there. It's like it's and it's tough um, because um, I think you know sometimes in our community it, it's limited. You know, it's like where do you, where do you go and you know get more resources? We only have so many trade organizations. We only have so many conferences and and you know we're all working, <laughs> working our jobs and you know how do, how do we get time to in, intake? you know, and, and source and research more information, you know, sometimes you're, you're just trusting, um, you know, who's ever speaking. Um, and so it can be hard to vet, vet your resources and go, okay, I, you know, this is, this is the path forward. Um, so yeah, I get it. I get it. I get that it's hard, um, to, to find what is, what is the, the good resource? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I guess that goes back to, you know, doing the, the critical thinking stuff um, versus, you know, determining whether something's a, um, a high demand, high control group. Um, so I guess that's kind of the question, vetting your resources. How do you, how do you vet your resources? Yeah. Yeah. Those are, those are another, another good question. Maybe, you know, and I could, I should write that down as a, I mean, I know we've done a podcast on critical thinking and, um, and maybe I'll add that to the um, resources uh, at the end of this this live stream. 
Well, and just for those listening, if you just go to my podcast page, you'll see one on on um, critical thinking skills with um, Dr. Suzanne Hetz and um, uh, Dan Estep, Dr. Dan Estep. So there's a podcast on that, and I'll also link it to this live stream at the end um, in Animal Training Fundamentals. But um, but yeah, I mean vetting resources. That's a, I mean that could be another good live stream too, because that's those are tough questions. Those are really good questions. Hmm. Yeah, guys, those are, get me thinking more. <laughs> get me thinking more. <laughs> yeah, I, and because I think I'm like you guys. I just I just keep a you know trying to read more, and and as you know, just because it's published doesn't mean it's a good a good thing you know I mean you have to you have to even read a publication with a critical eye right and um and that's not always easy either yeah there's oh yeah that's a that's a very good question mm. Mm, gosh guys well dang I'm gonna have to think on that one more <laughs> Well, I, I appreciate you guys hanging out for this one. It's kind of a heavy one, um, but uh, um, it's a, it's an important one to think about and discuss a little bit. Um, but yeah, hopefully you can kind of let that one sink in. Um, I might go back to our recap here. Let that one sink in and, uh, and maybe think about some of the things that we are exposed to and, and how we... Uh, how we take it in and make our decisions about whether it's information we're going to use or not and what path we're going to go on. But, um, but yeah, I think a lot of it is, you know, how, how free we are to, well, <laughs> the environment controls all our behavior, doesn't it? It's, I guess it's about what you expose yourself to and <laughs> what you allow yourself to take in. Oh gosh, so much to discuss here. This makes me think about our upcoming GOATS uh, um, presentations because one of them is on degrees of freedom with Sean, Will, and Masa Nishimuta. So, so I might go to that right now. <laughs> so this one's coming up on September 5th and um, it's, it's pretty cool because it is about choice and control and about degrees of freedom and a new, exam, a new lens to examine animal welfare. But I think it kind of relates to our conversation here today. So um, those of you that are members of AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, you get to attend this for free. You just got to send me an email and let me know you want to participate and I will add you to the, um, the webinar. Uh, if you're not a member, you can also participate too. You just have to register for that. You can go, that, go to ATF goats.com to register for that one. Um, prior to that, though, we are having another uh, goats presentation called Training Birds of Cre Prey Without Equipment. And that one is coming up next Monday. So we won't have a live stream. We'll have this goats presentation. And you do have to register for that if you're not a member. But if you're a member, just again, send me an email and I'll add you to the list. And there is the website atfgoats.com to learn more um, and to register if you're a non-member. And you will get a badge for participating in these. Um, and if you can't attend live, um, the recording will be available afterwards but it's always fun to attend live so um, so of course that means there's not a live stream on Monday um, and unfortunately I'm so sorry to say guys I can't do a tower talk on the Tuesday after um, so I uh, won't be able to do that but again we'll have the amazing goats talk on Monday so please join us that uh, then and again um, how do you become a member just go to animaltrainingfundamentals.com choose your membership of of uh choice <laughs> whichever one you want and uh and you can uh, be um you become a member and participate in those cool events all right there you go <laughs> i'm a little lost for words all of a sudden okay guys well there you go uh, a lot a lot of talking today versus videos but you know we like to mix it up and again um like i said i think uh ta -ta -ta. i think you will enjoy this book and this documentary and these ted talks from to um, get you thinking some more so more learning for you if you want to uh and uh, learn a little bit more about these topics. Well, thank you for coming. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll learn more about training birds without uh, equipment next week. So there you go. <laughs> 
thank you for the headache says says Anetta uh ready for next Monday yeah I know there's so much going on what can I say so it's uh fall's turning out to be very busy we got so much going on I got I gotta I gotta write a paper now within I don't let's see <laughs> yeah I, I've got all these conference things coming up for some reason um all these vet conferences and I have to write papers now so so I gotta go write a paper today after I finish putting this up on on the internet um because I have to put it in our education program so so I hope you all have a great day and um and you know go do something to lift your spirits up this was a heavy talk so <laughs> all right guys I look forward to seeing you uh, Monday for our training birds of prey without equipment with Thomas Anderson and uh, and we'll get get some more uh education going on okay thank you all again for participating have a good day